Good afternoon. Good afternoon all and thank you for joining us for another Secret Sunday session today. Today I'm joined, joined by Layla McKinnon from the Northern Rivers who is an amazing journalist so I am very privileged to be joined by her today and we're going to talk a lot about her career and also being a mum and the challenges that she did face um, along her journey and story as well. But to kick us off today Layla would you just like to give the audience a little brief overview of who you are and what it is that you do. Okay, uh, thanks for having me. I'm a journalist um, and uh, although I was started very early in print, by the time I was 20, I was a cadet at Wind Television in Rockhampton. And then I was nine years in Queensland working all around the place, sort of finding my feet. And then I moved to Sydney and I've been a foreign correspondent. I've hosted the Olympics. I've interviewed Princes William and Harry, Beyonce, Robin Williams, you know, so many amazing people. Uh, and mostly though, I've done news and current affairs. So floods and coups and um, earthquakes and you know, what cyclones, <laughs> you name it. So yeah, I've seen it, I've seen it all from sort of Beyonce to um, to Cyclone Yazi. Yeah, wow. And if we take it back to the first initial moments of when you began your career, why did you want to pursue journalism? Well, I was good at English at school and I really wanted to study history and English literature, but then I also wanted to make enough money to, you know, buy a house and have a family. And I thought it would probably be more lucrative to, to go into journalism. So I did a journalism degree. Also, my granddad was a journalist. I mean, I didn't get to meet him he died before I was born, but I feel like it's all in there somewhere. Um, I kind of knew that he had been a journalist, so that must have uh, piqued my interest as well. So yeah, I kind of went into journalism to you know, make a living and using my skills at talking a lot and <laughs> English. <laughs> and are you happy with your career and, and where it's taken you? Oh, so happy. It's been amazing. Uh, just the thing about it is, you never really miss out on anything. If something's happening, you're at the heart of it, asking the questions. And also the people that you meet. And I'm not even talking about the famous people, I'm talking about people who are going through um, terrible things or who have learned something amazing or have done something incredible for someone else. If it's newsworthy, then they're interesting. So I've been really fortunate to interview people about the most incredible things, including I interviewed a group of 100 year olds. This is uh, getting on for 20 years ago. So I interviewed them about World War I and the Great Depression, um, you know, all those incredible people that survived those awful years. And then obviously World War II as well. Um, so yeah, I, I, it couldn't have been a better career. Yeah, I've loved it. Yeah. Wow. And do you find the journalism industry is changing dramatically in the environment that we're currently living in with social media and the added pressures that that brings? Yes, it's definitely in flux. I think that it will work itself out. The most important thing to remember is that people will always want content. So they will want to know what's happening with the pandemic, or the economy, or you know, is China as big a threat as we think, or what's happening in America? People need to know that stuff. And where we are at the moment is that people are learning about reliable sources and having to subscribe to somebody who will keep you reliably informed. Uh, at some stage, we're going to have to address the fact that you can't get your news from Facebook. You know, you can to a certain extent but if you but you might get fooled you know there was a story the other day that influencers were told to say on Facebook that Pfizer was dangerous and no good and when the BBC investigated it they tracked it back to a company in Russia that was paying influencers to spread information so I think we're getting a bit more cluey we're learning more and the industry is changing but people will always need information so I, I wouldn't deter anybody from going into it. 
Yeah, well, and I find journalism is so important as well because the power of storytelling is unbelievable in, in every space that you're in. And journalists really have that power to do that, to tell stories. And as you said, going into people's homes and listening to World War I stories, that's just phenomenal. How do you approach interviews and people with history and stories like that, like something so vulnerable and so raw? Um, I think that you have to be sensitive and you have to be authentic. And I, and I think there's a bit of a, um, a misunderstanding in the community, which journalists are their own worst enemies and that we often portray ourselves or are portrayed in movies as hard and competitive and fake and unfeeling. But I don't think that journalists can ever get above the beginning kind of area unless you have sensitivity and empathy because people won't share their stories with you people can you know what it's like you can feel somebody's interested and, and caring and genuine so um, you definitely need all of those qualities and I think it's a matter of as you do more and more of it you become um, more sensitive to how difficult it is for people to, to, to tell their stories and how to go about encouraging them in the right way. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit more personally now. Um, now, the journalism industry, we can't deny it, is very focused on the glamorous lifestyle in terms of the way that you present yourself in broadcast, broadcast journalism. Did that ever affect the way that you saw yourself or your body image because you were constantly glammed up or felt you had to look a certain way to be on camera? Uh, no, I don't think that I really, um, that it really was difficult for me in the way that I perceived myself. I was, I've always kind of been overconfident. And well, you know, one of those people that I kind of, um, I'll back myself. So I think that's probably my best quality and that I'll back myself. But the, where I did find it hard was when, um, and this is before Instagram and, and Facebook and Twitter, people would email in criticizing me or people would criticize me in the newspaper and in all sorts of ways and the way that I look or, you know, um, if I had a wonky eye or ratty teeth or hadn't done my roots or wore some outfit they didn't like, it takes a while to get used to that. And I think that more people, like everybody has to deal with that now, but back then, it, you know, it was just people on TV. So you just kind of, you do develop a thicker skin um, over the years and, um, I've seen it with the people that have come through after me. People like Erin Molan came to me and spoke to me about it, saying, you know, how, how difficult it was. And, yeah, it is really just a matter of putting your head down and, and doing your job. And the thing that you have to remember is, and what I told her is, you're not a model. You're not, you know, an Instagram model or whatever. It's not about how you look. Concentrate on the message, on the story. You're a rugby league expert. I'm a news reporter. That's what we're here for. You have to remember yourself that you're not there to be judged on whether you should have got your roots done a week sooner. <laughs> I swear people always have something to comment on and always something that's negative about what you're doing. And I think they take away from the job that, as you said, the job that you're doing instead of, you know, just the look that you're showing and projecting to the world. How do you find that yeah. in those initial moments, how did you cope? Um, well, I remember reading a really horrible story about myself in the paper and just going for a long walk, you know, just shake it off, get moving, do something else that's interesting, think about your story. When, when I did the Olympics in London, I was getting criticised on Twitter and that's notorious, everybody does, because you've got an audience that you don't normally have and they all have opinions and everybody thinks they could do it because they watch it. But I'm sure if you put them in front of a camera and they had to talk about things that were appearing before them that they wouldn't think they were quite as good as they thought. And in that, that particular occasion, I just took the Twitter off my phone and I thought the only people who I have to impress are myself and my bosses, maybe my family. So they'll give me the feedback I need. If I'm not doing it right or I shouldn't wear something or I, 
you know, the message is getting garbled, they'll let me know. So I don't need to hear from every Tom, Dick and Harry with an opinion at home. So I took it off. So I think it's a combination of shaking it off and ignoring it. Yeah. And being a mum as well, how do you relay those messages to your daughter that's growing up in an environment where social media is probably bombarding her and she'll be exposed to that as she's growing older? How do you let her know to just just shake it off? It'll be fine. Um, Yeah, I think that it's partly um, walking the walk in that you, the way you present yourself to the children they will follow in your footsteps so definitely I don't you know and I have moments oh I'm wrinkly uh, my legs are too fat I should have been doing more exercise lately or my arms are dropping (laughs) the tuck shop arms but I don't say any of those things in front of the children and so I don't concentrate on the way that either of them look but in particular her Gwen her name is I you know, I don't tell her, oh, you're so beautiful, or you look so beautiful in that outfit, or you look really pretty today, or because then that makes her think, well, would make her think that that's the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. So I just try not to talk to her about it. And then the other stuff, I think, with friends and Instagram and and criticism, just, I'll have to just bring her up to be as confident as possible and, and take those on as they come, because you can't really prepare anyone. It's, I guess it's just keeping the lines of communication open and I have to remember that they're not as tough as me yet (laughs) and so when they do get hurt or something I just not to dismiss it because to me oh who cares what they think but they haven't got there yet so um yeah definitely it's a it's a path to tread between taking it seriously but not turning it into a big deal yeah oh definitely do you think body image will be a thing that your kids go through where they experience negative body image moments well I think um you know it'd almost be better off asking you about that because I didn't grow up with it to the you know we had magazine we had dolly magazine Mm -hmm. but we didn't have people commenting you know apart from my mum who was a bit tough on me um I didn't have people saying anything about the way I look to me because people don't say that to your face generally unless they're a bully so really yeah I'll probably be turning to you or you know younger people around me to who have grown up with that just to ask you know what would help Yeah, I think definitely, unfortunately, we're not immune to it. And with social media, you can't filter that stuff out. And it's now become, I think, as well, like a school playground conversation with young girls, with the diet culture, wanting to change this and look a certain way. And now that you're exposed to it 24-7, unfortunately, I do think it's a thing that most young girls and even boys are, are probably going to go through. But if they've got supportive uh, family and supportive friends and, and it sounds like that you're doing an amazing job already. So I feel like that you your kids will get through it quite well because, as you said, you're, you're educated on them and you know how to support them through that time. Do you think there's a certain point where you can't, I know my mum talks about this all the time, but you can't wrap them in the blanket as well. You kind of have to push them out there to just go live, go experience and learn on your own. Oh, for sure. Yes. Yeah. And I do. um, I, I try not to do things for them. I think it's the tractor parenting, they call it now, where you push all the obstacles out of the way so that they can do something um, I try not to do that and, and uh, I mean, I probably do and don't even notice it sometimes, but when they want something, um, like when Ted was, uh, last year, Ted was seven um, and he wanted a pocket knife. And I said, and I knew that he should be in a higher reading group at school because he's, he was a good reader. And I said, if you get into the top reading group at school, I'll get you the pocket knife. And he said, well, how do I do that? And I said, well, I don't know. You'll have to talk to your teacher. So he went and asked her and she said, okay, well, we, we'll do three week, three tests, one a week. And if at the end of those three weeks, you've passed all the tests, you can go into the next reading group. 
And so bang, he did it. And I'd been on at him to try and get into this reading group for a long time. And so he passed the, the third test and he said, oh, can you let my mum know? Because um, she's going to get me a knife. <laughs> I told my husband and he said, what does he get for getting in the next group? A gun? <laughs> she probably horrified the, the teacher. <laughs> God, you probably got a message home going, uh, your son wants a knife. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've got one. He wants to be like Bear grills, so, you know, he wants the knives and the, all that kind of stuff, the combat gear. That's so good, though. But anyway, he was he, he then knew that he'd have done all of that himself and he could do something, so, yeah. Yeah, wow. Is it hard for a mum to step back? Um, I, I think it is. I, I think it is for some mums. Um, I kind of value the idea that they will feel great when they've achieved something. So, yeah, so I kind of, you know, I feel that concept of, of pushing them forward. And, and to give my own mum credit, if I wanted something at a shop when I was little, I had, you know, she'd give me the money and I'd have to go and ask for it. And, you know, it's all those little tiny gentle nudges in all the smaller situations that, you um, that give you a sense of achievement. And I think that's why there's so much anxiety among young people. You know, obviously there are lots of reasons, but one of them might be that they don't feel that they can fix things that go wrong. If you can teach children that they've been able to fix things as children, then they'll grow up a bit more confident and maybe a bit less, less anxious about not having someone there to fix things. Yeah, how great. What a great message. I, I want to talk a little bit now about your career and also coming and becoming a mum and how that sort of works. So I think a lot of people in the media as well really push that. I've read a lot of comments um, previously that how becoming a mum and then pursuing a career as an independent woman, people see that as a negative thing. How did you find the balance in becoming a mum and still wanting to pursue your career? Uh, well, I was fortunate in the fact that I was older. So I was 40 and 41 when I had the children. And I created a really stable, strong base by then in that I had lots of contacts and I had done sport and news and current affairs and entertainment and radio and writing and so I could be called upon to do lots of different things so when I had children I wasn't charging at it a hundred percent anymore you know I had the skills to fill in for people or do things differently um, so that was to my benefit but you know I wouldn't recommend leaving it till that late because you just don't know if you're going to be able to have children at that age so but I've noticed that with the younger women coming through after me who are still doing all of you know the, the harder stuff the foreign correspondent um, work like Amelia Adams I mean she's been in London and America in some of the most turbulent times in recent history and she has two very young children but her husband is looking after them when she's not. And I think that that's one thing that gets lost in the debate quite often is that if you're fortunate, there's two parents who are involved and it's not just about the woman. Mm -hmm. It's, um, you know, that there, there's two of you and you can have turns or, you know, but it is a juggle. So I think that the role that men play in this often gets lost in the conversation. Um, and also the role that men play in the work that's done at home, apart from child raising, as in washing, cooking, cleaning, um, you know, all the other things. So um, it's really, if you are in a couple, then you can juggle each other's careers and your children together. And I think that's amazing if you have a supportive partner. If you're on your own, then, you know, <laughs> I just applaud people who are doing it on their own because and I you know so many of my friends are everything is very um difficult because it's how do you juggle with one hand you know you've got to do it all yourself um so yeah I don't have the answer 
but I just think, yeah, if you are in a couple, then there's two people there and it's not just on the woman. Um, and, you know, we're all just doing the best we can. Yeah. Why do you think women are still criticised if they are not the one being presently home looking after the kids and if the man is looking after the kids? Why do you think there's still so much criticism around that? Uh, people people love to judge and people also love to make themselves feel a bit better by putting someone else down I think you know not all people but some people um I think that's one thing that I've definitely taken away from becoming a parent is that I don't judge other parents at all and you know you want to call your baby pebble fine you know we're, that name means something to you then it must be really special to you and your child is gorgeous right so I do not judge on that um you know if you feed them sugar or give them their iPads at a restaurant or it's just you getting through the day so yeah I think that if everybody could be a little bit judgmental the world would be a better place but yeah I think often women are hard on other women and um, hopefully it's slowly changing. Yeah. Are you hard on yourself as a mum? Uh, yes, yes, I guess so. I'm pretty hard on myself for most things. So, so yes. Um, definitely I'll sort of replay in my mind a conversation. I'll, and also I'll give myself a pat back if I did something right. But if I snap or I'm unreasonable, or I said, you know, I kind of dismissed something because I was in a bad mood, mm -hmm. then I definitely make a note of it in my head. Um, but, uh, you know, as I said, I'm lucky. I, I changed my life. I moved to the country. I work part-time. So I'm in a good position to, um, to do the best job I can. And in the end, too, you just have to think, well, they're loved, they're confident, they're learning things and um you know probably doing too much you know I'm probably thinking about them too much you know, a little bit of benign neglect I think doesn't hurt I mean I grew up in the 70s and my mum and dad didn't know who where I was some of the time but I had some great adventures so um yeah I I do I do criticize myself but I quickly pull myself up on that do you compare yourself to how other mums may interact or be with their kids and, you know, with the rise of social media and everyone's mum vlogging and posting about their life and how, quote, unquote, great they are as a mum, do you ever get immune or even jealous of other mums that look like they've got their shit together? Um. Not really, because I suspect that, you know, scratch beneath the surface and everybody's the same, really. I'm sure that they have biscuits in the bottom of their car and shout at their kids when they shouldn't and, you know, pour themselves a drink on occasion because they've made it through the day and they have nothing left to give or have a bath or something. Yeah, no, not really. I kind of, I'm, I, I guess because I've been in the business of creating images and telling stories and I kind of you know I can kind of tell that everything's not quite as perfect as it always is in that one snap yeah yeah and now I want to talk a little bit about you work a lot with women and you've done podcasts about even talking to other mums in your experience do mums have this this essence about them where they are striving and strong, independent women. And do you think that that should be embraced more, that women should want to be strong and independent? Do I think mothers, do I think mothers are strong and independent and we should value yeah. that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely think, I mean, I wouldn't dismiss anybody for not being a mum, but I think um, that you learn to do things um, as, you know, as well as ever, but in much less time as a mum, that the, the juggle, um, you have to do the juggle, so you're actually whipped through some things that, that might take, um, that might have taken you longer before you were a mum. 
Um, so I definitely think that that, that should be valued. Um, but yeah, I would I would never say that because I'm a mum, I have anything that anybody else doesn't. I, I think that the days of people thinking that because you're a mum, you're not as good, then they are definitely over. And, and I had an experience when I was going to go to the London Olympics and I was pregnant and I told my boss who was a very old school, you know, from the, from the original days of television. And he, I could tell he wasn't very happy, but we had got to the stage where there was nothing he could do about it. I mean, he couldn't get rid of me because I was pregnant because we had rules about that now. Um, so I just did my job and, and, you know, at the end of it, he came up and just gave me a big kiss on the cheek and said, thank you so much for the job that I did in particular when I interviewed um, William and Harry, you know, there was a lot of pressure on that and there'd been a lot of juggling behind the scenes to get that interview. And, uh, um, you know, I, I just own it. I think I did a good job. And so, yeah, he was thrilled. So, um, yeah, but it's strange because it would have been like 10 years before that pregnant women weren't really welcomed on TV. Yeah, it's um, it's crazy how the environment has definitely changed from, yeah, even the start of the 21st century to now. So much has just advanced very quickly. It's almost gone extreme to the other end. Um, talking about an interview with William and Kate, how was that experience? <laughs> oh, it was fun. With, so it wasn't with Kate, it was with William and Harry so, um, yeah. back when they were <laughs> talking to each other, yeah. presumably. <laughs> um, but, but um, yeah, so it was in London and we, so we had put our hand up and, and negotiated and they had okayed me doing the interview, but I was getting people coming at me from every direction to what I should say and how I should address them and, um, you know, what, what would happen when they walked through the office and it was quite stressful. And then, so what it was, was they would walk in and Ken Sutcliffe would throw away from whatever we were doing to a commercial break. In the commercial break, they would be mic'd up and sit down. It would come back from the break on me and I would say, surprise, surprise, and, and do the interview. And then they would leave and we would have a photo taken of me and the princes for social media. And, but then that was it, but they would just leave. So they came in and they did that. They mic'd them up and I spoke to them in the commercial break and Prince William said to me something about being pregnant. Um, and I said, oh, I said, oh, yeah, the, ba the baby must know that I'm excited because it's been kicking around. And he went, oh, really? And then he kind of went, like, he couldn't be that interested because yeah. it would start rumours. Um, and, um, yeah, so we did the interview. And then um, I shouted out group photo at the end and all these people just came running because I knew that people would want to have a photo with them, but we weren't allowed. So they just sat there and had this photo with all these people around them. And then um, Dina Smith went to the Solomon Islands with William and Kate a few months later um, to cover it. And when she met him, she said, I'm Davina from Channel 9. And he said, oh, has Layla had her baby yet? Aww. So I thought that that was pretty cool. I've got weird goosebumps. Yeah. Oh, how cool. Yeah. That's got to make you feel. Cool. And David. Prince is I love you. Yeah, it did. But I told my husband, he goes, oh, he's good. He's in the PR business. <laughs> he's, he's nailed it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Were you nervous to like sit down with the princes? Like, Yes, I was nervous. I wasn't nervous of them, but I was, I felt the pressure to make it um, interesting and entertaining and yeah, it had become a big thing. So yeah, I was definitely nervous and I was happy when it was over. Um, but it's kind of fun because that gets the heart racing, the, yeah. the ones that make you really nervous. Yeah, they definitely, um, like things like walk-ins and are an affair, which is what we call when you go and confront the bad person yeah. and you can be tracking them for a week or two before you actually get them. They're really nerve wracking, but afterwards it's so exciting. You, yeah. you, know, you feel that rush of endorphins. Yeah, wow. And even... Like you said, you spoke to so many people over the years, you Beyonce, you Robin Williams. How do you prepare for an interview with someone that is seen as so significant? And do they live up to, I guess, the hype that they are? are they are they just still genuine humans in the end at the end of the day? 
situation often if it's arranged it's just the, the situation where there's a row of journalists outside the door and you each get three to seven minutes mm. and so you've got to go in hard and just kind of wake them up a bit you know I mean Carl Stefanovic's a great he's really great at that kind of thing he'd walk to the room singing and they'd be <laughs> like oh Who's this guy? You know, and also you could be following a whole lot of really bad journalists who don't speak English very well, who have just bored them to death. And if you come in all bright and interesting and smash out some questions, then it generally can can go quite well. But if they're not in the mood, oh, it can just be terrible. And the thing is, too, when you have to interview one person from the movie, quite often you've got to interview everybody from the movie. So you have to spend the whole day there interviewing six people at four minutes each, including the director and, you know, who you're just going to throw it in the bin. Yeah. So it's hard, you know, that's part of the challenge is to do, survive all the other interviews, but get the one you want and get it as great as it can be um, to, to put to air. And, you know, that I found all of that much more difficult than being a news journalist because news is, you know, what you've got to do. People know why you're there. You're covering the story. You, you know, you have to be sensitive and, and look after people. But to be in that artificial situation where they might not be happy, is there's an art to it. And you just get better with practice. Um, but still, if somebody really doesn't want to do it, <laughs> you just... It's hard, to, it's hard to make it work. I think what I would do now with my experience and my confidence now is lean into how bad it is and make them look like an even bigger ass than they are already being and then put it to air as well yeah. because you'd get just as many, just as much interest if you did that. But it, but when I was younger, I wasn't, you know, I was too shy and wanted to please people too much to, to do that. Over the years, who do you think was the most disappointing interview or one of the quote unquote worst? Well, I threw one with Eddie Murphy in the bin because he was like really hostile and difficult. Um, I struggled a little bit with Denzel Washington, but we kind of worked it out. And, and that one is online if you want to look it up. I think I did look at that one where he oh, kept yeah. asking about why are you asking about the past? Was that yeah, why are you asking? Well, he said, why are you asking about the past? I don't talk about the past. And then he said, well, why are you asking about the future? And I was like, yeah, well, I don't I really know. What can I... How are you now? <laughs> so, but I think that kind of worked out in the end. He was he was all right in the end. Um, but and you have things like I interviewed Pierce Brosnan, and they told me not to ask about James Bond. And I thought, well, what else? What else? You know, it was just here? Bond. So I asked him about I asked him about it, and just had to put up with the backlash, and it was fine. I got it in the end. So you've sort of got a play each situation uh, yeah. as it presents itself. Wow. And then if we look at the other spectrum of things, what's been the highlight of your career? Um, well, if we're still talking about celebrities, uh, Jamie Foxx was a great celebrity. He was really fun and interesting and entertaining because, I mean, he, you can tell he's an entertainer. Some actors are actors mm -hmm. and then, you know, they're not going to turn it on. They might have fun on Graham Norton, but if they're presented with, you know, journalist number 36 from Australia, you know, they're not performing for you. Yeah. Um, so that, but um, highlights for that, yeah, I'd say Jamie Foxx was amazing. It was, it was a real thrill to see, to talk to Robin Williams. That was great. Um, and Be I love Beyonce. Um, so I interviewed her with Destiny's Child and that was amazing. And then I interviewed her on her own with Dream Girls, and she was a bit more yeah. guarded on her own, which, you know, they usually are. Um, and, and other highlights, I guess, things like doing the Olympics and um, I went to Guantanamo Bay and covered a terrorism trial, which was amazing. And it, it was great to see the Academy Awards up close and how that mm. all works. And then things like I say, like the 100 year olds from Brisbane mm. who were just so inspiring and interesting um, or you know, people who've lost their homes to floods or who want to share a message because their child or someone they love died of an illness that they shouldn't have had to die mm. from. You know, you, I really feel the burden of their faith in me mm. to tell their stories properly. Um, so yeah, so many highlights and I've done some, you know, I've had some great jobs. Yeah, you've yeah. devoted so much to your career over a long period of time. 
where do you find time in between all of that you know those long days on end interviewing waiting to be to interview other people where do you find time for yourself and all of that well I don't think I ever did I mean it's not until I moved up here and I had children and they were kind of they started going to school that I realized there was time for other things and then I did take up some hobbies that I had never I never had a hobby um, and so I didn't really, I just worked all the time, but, you know, in a job that was amazing and I loved, um, you know, and then you'd have time like a day off and go for a swim or something, but I didn't have any other projects. So I, it's only as I've got older and I've, I've moved up here and, and made some time and had a bit more balance in my life um, that, yeah, that I've been able to have any time for anything. And, you know, I think that's why you should choose a job that you love. And that's interesting because you're only going to really succeed at it if you do it to the best of your ability all of the time, learn from the failures, get up the next day, do it again, um, you know, work all day, look back at it, think how can I do better next time? Um, and that's why, you know, it's not a chore to do it if you really love it. Mm. Do you wish that you found time or had time for yourself during that intense and stressful time of your life? Um, not really, no, because I just kind of, I just wanted to do my job and then, you know, cook dinner and go to bed. <laughs> I was like, I, I kind of, I'm grateful for it now because I'm ready, you know, I am grateful for it now, but I, I probably wouldn't change that. I'd still, you know, work that hard and, um, uh, you know, and I would hope that my children you know do have something that they're passionate about that they do want to spend a lot of time on um, but I think it is yeah it is good to have a hobby maybe I should have you know my husband surfs and that's really great for him mentally um you know and I maybe I am a little bit crazy but I did yeah no I didn't have a hobby and I probably wouldn't do it any different did your career um ever take a toll on your mental health um no, I don't think so. No, I, I had I had some challenges when I was in my late 30s to when I was 40 and I was doing IVF and um and working and not telling anybody that, you know, that was a step too far, you know, in terms of I was still working really hard. And I was having IVF and I was exhausted and, you know, hormonal and, you know, it was fine. It was fine. I, I got through the, the IVF, um, you know, with a great result, two great results. Um, but yeah, I, de I think it, there were times that I was probably a bit depressed. Um, and, you know, I had to, I remember at one stage, I thought, oh, well, look, I'm just going to have to stop and get fit and get myself in order again before I start again and this is why I think I did like 12 cycles of IVF to have my son and so I had a break somewhere in between where you know I started jogging and eating better and um and I even thought oh do you know what I should do I should actually relax and like lie in the sun you know I had such so crazy that that wasn't just something I would do anyway I thought oh, there's a good plan. And so I, like, I remember going down to Clo Valley and lying in the sun going, okay, this is good. I'm relaxing. I'm lying in the sun. <laughs> like I was ticking a box. Yeah. So yeah, um, I, I, that was probably the only time. But, you know, there were times when I was sad, when I, you know, when I covered the tsunami and people were hunting for their loved ones and we were interviewing them and, you know, they obviously weren't going to be found. And I would go, I would be okay at work but I remember going home at night and crying, mm -hmm. but not in a depressed way, but in a release that is totally normal and you'd be crazy if you didn't, um, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I wouldn't put that down to, to mental health. I think it's probably good that I was dealing with the emotions. Mm. And if you don't mind me asking with your IVF journey, um, was that a tough time for you and a struggle to go in and out of cycle? Yeah, it was, but I kind of just, um, you know, what I tend to do in a situation like that is I just put my head down and keep going. Mm. So I just, you know, if it didn't work out, I would just think, oh, okay, well, I'll do it again. You mm. know, it, it, 
you know, I'll tough it out. And towards the end, before, before I had Ted, I actually did go and see a counsellor from the clinic. And, and I said to her, I just wanted to meet you in case I need you, because I know there will come a time where I'm just going to have to give up. Mm. And then I want her to talk to. Yeah. And I guess she thought I had it worked out because she just kind of didn't say much. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and then, it, yeah, it worked out. So, you know, I wouldn't have been averse to getting help in that situation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it worked out in the end. Were you ever scared that you weren't going to be a mum? Um, yeah, I did. Yes, I did. Um, that's what, yeah, I thought, oh, okay, I'll, you know, I'll address that when the time comes. But I was, you know, quite good at, you know, putting that in my back pocket as a future problem. Yeah. You know, something that Layla would have to deal with. So, um, yeah, and then so then I did have Ted, and then I was just really lucky because I, I had Gwen very soon after that. So they are 19 months apart. So when I was, when Ted was nine months old, I got pregnant with, with Gwen really quickly. So yes, just got so lucky. So it kind of makes me think there's the, in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, I think it is, he kind of, or Rays of the Lost Ark, and he goes under that door and then he grabs his hat from behind just as it's about to crush it. I feel like that's me getting my two kids <laughs> oh, good. oh it all turned out sounds amazing for you and were you, do you think you're prepared to be a mum um uh, no 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 I wouldn't say that and after so when Ted was nine months old I really felt lost I really felt like I didn't know who I was anymore and I um I wanted to be myself again. And then I got offered the opportunity to go to England and cover the birth of Prince George. Um, and so I went and thinking that I would only be away for a week, but then it took a couple of weeks, mm. maybe two and a half weeks, and I started to freak out. I mean, Ted was with his dad, um, but uh, I ended up ringing my boss and saying, look, I'm really sorry, but I think I'm going to have to go home because, you know, my child is really small and I didn't expect this. Yeah. Um, and he said he understood, but then the Prince George was born the next day, so I didn't have to um, go. But, yeah, I, but while I was over there, I mean, I had a great time. I really did. I really did embrace being myself again. And in a way, I criticised myself for that because I was... You know, I should have just seen it through um, because, you know, all mums have to give up things from before, but I wasn't ready and I sort of took a little detour away from it and, and came back to it. Um, and, you know, I'd probably do it again, to be honest. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I feel like having children it has really... Um, I was very immature because I did work all the time and I was selfish and I feel like having children and I'm not saying this for everybody by any means, but I definitely have become much more mature um, and well-rounded as a result of having the children. Yeah. Wow. And do you miss it? Do you miss being in the midst of that heart thumping investigative sort of journalism aspect? Yeah, I do. And I, luckily, um, they still, you know, I still work at Channel 9 and I fill in for people. And it's, I think it's good for them because if they need someone um, at short notice who can do the job, and, it, you know, it's a job presenting on TV that looks easy. And, you know, I'm not saying it's particularly hard, but you've got to have the skills. Um, so I was surprised, you know, not that long ago, I was sitting on the sofa here in the Northern Rivers and I got a call from the boss of the Today Show saying Ali Langton had um, you know, broken her leg, much, much worse than that, um, at um, the Gold Coast and could I host the show the next morning? And I hadn't done the Today Show in about seven years. So I went up there and, and had that feeling again and, and got back into it. And I, I always do summer. So I had, still get a taste of it and I do love it. Yeah, that's so good that you can still do your career, but kind of be flexible with it as well as you're pursuing being a mum as well. And is there any uh, future other kid plans in place? Or oh, gosh, no, no, no. I think, like I said, I was lucky. I was already, um, I was already at the the higher the, the age spectrum for having children. I, I, you know, I think some people. I don't know. 
Sonia Kruger had a baby at about my age, but I think it was from a, it was from a, an egg donor. So no, 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 that's all done for me. Um, uh, you know, so I'm still working, still filling in for people at work and, um, I, you know, I've been doing things like a podcast and I'm, I'm working on a book at the moment, which is nice to have a project. Um, and yeah, raising the kids, yeah. it's a good mix. And then lastly, just to give any advice or even just your opinion from your experience on how to balance that mum career life and as well as be a good role model for your kids, what could you offer to any parents? Well, yeah, first, a bit of advice for people starting out. I think, you know, um, before you even get to, to that stage is definitely to meet all the people in the industry. If you want to go and work for Channel 9, then um, you should do work experience there or ring them up or, um, you know, and then just sort of meet as many, even people from the other networks or whatever. The more people you meet, the more you hear and the, and the further that you will go. Um, and yeah, just work hard, be passionate, learn from your mistakes. Don't beat yourself up about them. Um, they're, they're all things that I say to people about starting out. Um, as for the juggle, oh, I don't know. I don't really feel, you know, qualified to give advice about that. I think that we all just do the best we can in the circumstances that we have. Mm -hmm. um, the only advice I think I would say about that is to be kind to yourself mm -hmm. because, you, you know, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. um, to, to do all of those things, to raise your kids. And, um, you know, sometimes you can go for it with the career because things are on an even keel with the children. And sometimes you need to pull back at work and because things are getting tricky with the kids. And it's, yeah, that it's too complicated for advice except to, to, be, to be flexible and to be kind to yourself. Yeah, no, awesome message out there. And that's the thing, every situation and every experience and every child is different. So not one answer is going to be right for everyone. But what you're doing is amazing and credit to you for the career that you've had and also the mum that you're being today. I think um, give yourself a pat on the back for that because even the stories that I watch you doing, they're just inspirational. And I thank you for all that you've done and you continue to do as well. Oh, thank you. Oh, thanks. It's been such a joy to talk to you and I respect what you're doing. Oh, thank you Fantastic. so much. Yeah, it is. It's great to be in the same space. And as you said, just storytell. I feel like there's a there's an art to it. So thank you for coming on today. And thank you everyone out there for watching another Secret Sunday session. Now, is there anywhere that we could catch you, whether it's online or if you're coming up and doing something um, special soon, where can people find you? Um, we're, well, because I'm in lockdown and Sydney's in lockdown, I'm, I'm sort of not popping up on the TV at any stage. Um, I do have a podcast on future women um, at the moment where I speak to um, amazing, successful women who are sort of a little bit less on the radar generally than, you know, some of the, the Hollywood stars, but women who've done amazing things in their lives. You can find that on Future Women. And I'm on at Layla McKinnon on Instagram for nothing too taxing pictures <laughs> of <it. laughs> awesome well once again thank you very much for joining us today and thank you everyone else out there as well for joining us for another secret sunday section we will catch you again in two weeks have a great sunday everyone and we'll see you soon